Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us at this precious hour called the lunch hour. But uh, most importantly, I really would like to thank Olympus for uh, creating this forum for us to be able to exchange some educational material, uh, interact and be able to discuss where Rhinology is going. So I'm uh, Anshul Sama, I'm based in uh, Nottingham University Hospital, and if you can't remember where that is, it's, it's Robin Hood uh, is the way we're usually remembered. So we, we steal from the rich, uh, and then not sure about giving to the poor, though. Uh, my remit is really to introduce uh, the symposium, and the perspective I wanted to give you was where are we right now, and then where are we going to go? And I'm going to have my colleagues and friends, uh, Christos and Stefan, then take things further. But if you look at that historical perspective, you can see that things started way back, a long time ago, 130 odd years ago, we started looking at doing sinus surgery. And you saw that the rate of progress to how we develop with new techniques and new technology was moderately slow. And you can see that there is an escalation happening. And between 1991 and now, it's definitely an explosion. Technology has, re uh, the, uh, our practice has really, really taken off. So the question is, how did we transcend? How did we go from traditional techniques that we learned uh, or our, our original sinus surgery on to more advanced stuff that we are tending to do right now, which is the endoscopic era, if we could call it that, um, where we're doing some advanced frontal work, pituitary, skull base, lateral. We are using the nasal passages, not just for the pathology that exists within it, but as a passageway to be able to address other pathologies way beyond the nose. And in my opinion, these advances are based on a couple of things. Well, we know that the anatomy hasn't changed. It is the same in 8084 as it is right now. The pathology, the conditions we're seeing may have changed a little bit, but the process or the pathophysiological processes are still the same. So what is it that's changed? What's really changed in that time period is our surgical techniques. We've become more sophisticated. We understand the physiology a little bit better, and we've changed our techniques on how we approach this. But also, the technology. The technology has allowed us to be able to do things that we were not able to do 50 years ago, 20 years ago. And that is what we're really here to discuss, is where is this technology going? What else are we going to be possibly be able to achieve? Why are the use of this technology? And in the technology, I think there are two aspects that really has changed our perspective in the last 10 years. And that is powered instruments and visualization. So visualization allows us to see what we're doing. We're not putting on a headlight and working in a dark room and waiting for the blood to wheel up and then say it's time to stop. We have tremendous visualization. We can see things now with our equipment that we were never able to do before, and hence our techniques have got better. And powered instruments are something that allows us to do what we were not able to do beyond the nasal cavities. Powered instruments that allow us to different handling, different angulations, bipolar, monopolar, at the end of the same uh, instrument allows us to control the surgical environment that we were not able to do in the past. So uh, definitely this has been one of the main reasons how we've advanced so much in our sinus surgery. Powered instrumentation that gives us different types of tips on our burrs and drills and depending on our uh, what we're trying to do, we actually have the technology to be able to support us in that area. Visualization is definitely something that has moved tremendously. 
And the visualization is not just us being able to look around corners and see different angulations in different areas, but it's the fact that what we see on the screen is tremendously clear as to what we are doing. I was brought up in the era where we worked down the telescope. And I worked with a colleague of mine for many years called Nick Jones, uh, who kind of worked there and you had a little limb that came out that taught the trainees as to what you were looking at. Uh, and now we work off screens which have such clarity. There's no doubt things like Im navigation and, uh, and image guidance is going to be something that helps and augments our practice as well. What are we looking for? We're really looking for speed and safety. We're looking of ways on how the technology can make our procedures faster, but very, very importantly, safe at the same time. And these kind of tools that are, we have now are helping us. So this is the uh, lens cleaner system that is a way of de uh, clogging your uh, debrider without having to take it out and get the nurse to, to clean it out. So all these little changes make a lot of difference. Safety, however, is paramount. So it's the fact that we are working on non-malignant pathology most of the time, and we want to be able to make sure that we, in a very confined environment between the orbit and the brain, we need to be able to make sure that we remain safe in this area. The, gui the, mark the guidelines have changed. You know, when I started off, we believed that if anything was lateral, to the coronal plane of the orbit, you would have to use an open technique for it. Endoscopic techniques wouldn't work. And now there isn't a recess around the frontal sinus and beyond that we cannot reach with our endoscopic techniques. So having brought you to this stage as to where we stand and why we stand here, what I'm going to do is introduce my colleagues, uh, Stefan and Christos, who are dear friends uh, who are going to share their views about where we feel we will be moving forward here. So if I could invite Stefan, who's going to talk to us about 4K, robotics, and orb orbital surgery.